The Cube at OpenStack Summit Atlanta 2014 is brought to you by Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. And Red Hat. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Okay, hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Atlanta for the OpenStack Summit. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with my co-host this week, Stu Miniman, analyst at wikibon.org. Our next guest is uh, Diane Mueller, Open Chef community, ma community manager for Red Hat. Uh, welcome back, we talked last year. Remember we had a great segment last year. Boy, a lot's changed in one year. Uh, also we had the, the pleasure of bringing theCUBE to the Red Hat Summit, which was really a great event. I it mean, was awesome it to was have you. It was eye-opening yeah. for us. Uh, and you know, I didn't know you had so many deck employees working for Red Hat. Yeah. And digital different gurus working well, in it. Well, you know, Red Hat has originated um, in Westford, Mass yeah. Massachusetts, and DEC is, you know, that's yeah. the home of they DEC. They poach so. all the talent out of the DEC, which is DEC has had one of the best architectures on the planet. They just missed the PC revolution. But anyway, that's a whole other CUBE conversation. Yeah, that'll show our age <laughs> really quickly. So. No, I knew DEC, what is DEC? So, um, give us the update. What's happened, obviously, give your perspective on the one year since last year, and, but then since the Red Hat Summit, what's the big conversations? What are the things that you're involved in right now? So what I'm involved in here specifically at the OpenStack Summit is um, using OpenStack's native um, heat orchestration tool set to deploy OpenShift, the platform as a service project that I work on. Um, we are you know, demonstrating doing that and I think what we're seeing now is sort of the maturity of heat as a project um, coming on board and being used in a number of um, enterprises and a number of um, customer sites uh, to actually get heat and use that as the orchestration tool set for uh, deploying not just OpenShift, but lots of other things. So heat's been really um, up and coming now and becoming a real valuable um, asset to the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, so that's been great. So being able to use heat or puppet or whatever your, the, whatever wheel you want for deploying has been one of the key pieces of the OpenShift mantra um, in getting your um, platform as a service established on your, whatever your infrastructure is. Um, that's been that's yeah. been one of the key things we've been working on here. Yeah. So, 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 Diane, since last year, you know, boy, is there. John said there, there's been so much change. I think at Red Hat Summit, Docker really was like one, one of the biggest discussions, which is uh, you know seems to be one of the the, the top things that platform as a service is supposed to deliver is that separation of my application, you know, from my infrastructure, so that I can manage them separately. Um, Cloud Foundry, of course, has you know made a lot of people pay attention again to what's going on in this space with everything that's going on. So, when you think back to you know last year in Portland to now, you know, walk us through. What, what's changing in the discussions? You know, what's the same? You know, where, 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 where's the activity? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of activity around Docker, especially at Red Hat. Um, we have engineers working embedded into the Docker engineering um, community, so there's been a lot of work there. We're getting Docker ready to be a first-class citizen inside of um, OpenShift, so um, if you look in the GitHub repo under Gear D, um, you can see a lot of the open source work that's been going on um, in the open um, that on making uh, OpenShift uh, utilize Docker images. We've, you know, the, the thing about Docker that's so amazing is, is the rapid growth of the images that are available um, already today in the Docker index. And we have sort of uh, a, a counterpart to that is cartridges and quick starts in the OpenShift universe. Um, and so to take, you know, we have five or 600 um, quick starts and cartridges that are available in the community, but the Docker index is just growing like at light speed. So I think there's, that must be just what, around 2,000. I mean, my must have hit that um, breaking point by now. And so all of those images will be available to be deployed um, in OpenShift using Gear D and the other orchestration tools that we're building into OpenShift and making available. So we had a comment on our crowd chat yesterday. Um, Chris had the top really vote of all the, so far the conference. And this is not on the billing, but around containers. Um, OpenStack needs to make containers a first class citizen. Any arguments against this? Question mark. Yeah, and then comment, there's a long ass thread, you see, it's really good. But Rich Miller, who's thought leader, a CUBE alumni, said, I would make a strong statement, without acknowledgement and real leadership in embracing containers, OpenStack will fail to gain traction. And that's a pretty heavy statement. 
It, you know, What's I, your take on that? I mean, do you guys... I, I know at Red Hat, we're doing a lot of work um, in the Docker community and to make Docker a first-class citizen, um, both on OpenStack and with OpenShift. So I think it's going to be a reality ra rather quickly. Um, and I'm, I, I don't have any hesitation in saying that, that Docker has got the momentum right now, and I think we will see the community uh, contributions to make it a first-class citizen inside of the OpenStack uh, ecosystem as well. So what's your take on the, the cloud now? I want to get your perspective from the stepping back and, and looking down at the industry. What's going on at the customer levels? Because at the end of the day, customers matter. A lot of customers are, are not coming forward. People saying, oh, competitive advantage, a lot of secret sauce going on. Yeah, it's got some names on stage, but you don't see a huge, it's not a parade of customers, but there's a ton of customer conversations happening. What are you seeing in the customer landscape about the cloud architectures? So I work on the open source side and on the community side, um, and actually I do see a parade of customers and community contributions going on, so there is a huge parade of people using... It's legit, there are it, there, tons of customers. There are tons of customers out there. I think um, maybe sometimes the way that we interact with them obfuscates who they are because they don't self-identify as contributors. Um, and I think that's one of, one of the issues we always see in open source communities is that customers end up having Red Hat do the submissions for them for patches and contributions. So that's, that's a little bit of um, a tough thing that we have yeah, to yeah. deal with. And, and but, no one likes to come but out. But I think, it. yeah, well, you know, it's a competitive advantage. Definitely a competitive advantage to use um, the open source tools um, and, and the, especially using um, Red Hat's uh, secret sauces. I actually don't think we have any secret sauces. All of our stuff is in GitHub. Um, the open it's how the customers stuff. are rolling them up that's a secret sauce. How they deploy and how they're architecting. Yeah, and I think it's the variations on the themes. And I'm seeing a lot of variations on the themes um, around storage, um, people using Ceph or Gluster, or um, we do a lot of work um, helping other people deploy um, OpenShift, particularly on lots of different infrastructure. So um, I think that the thing, and one of the keys here is the interoperability. So OpenStack, uh, we've seen a lot of movement towards that, a lot of POCs, a, um, a lot of production level um, work being done on, on OpenStack these days. But we also see this, um, the ability to have your different layers deploy on different infrastructure as a service, or even on bare metal. So for us, um, it's the interoperability piece that's key. So making sure, for me, one of the keys is to make sure that OpenShift deploys anywhere with whatever set of tools um, that enterprise is looking to use. So yeah. that's really, I think. So, so Diane, you know, what are you seeing in those companies that are building cloud? You know, kind of the cloud service providers, the the, the managed hosting guys. You know, you know, what, what's what's the latest on how they're building the infrastructure and what challenges they're facing? So I think, um, and I, it's been talked about here a lot too, is. Um, there aren't a lot of OpenStack ninjas out there to be hired. Um, so if you are, are an OpenStack ninja and you, you shouldn't be looking for a job because everybody's looking for you these days. <laughs> and, and I think that's education is one of the key things is that um, you know, Red Hat has great certification programs for different pieces of OpenStack and that's really been a method to grow people into the skill sets in order to deploy them. So uh, you know we have OpenShift certification and OpenStack certification stuff that's going on that you can you can take those lessons, but I think the as a community, we need we have gr pretty good documentation for both um, OpenStack and other things. But we need to grow more. You know, um, I don't want more rock stars. I want more people who can actually deploy this stuff and actually use it in um, in production services. Because um, we, you know we have consulting services. It's great. It's wonderful. But I really want this stuff to be dead simple to deploy and use. It shouldn't I mean, be like a big customization. Yeah, yeah, I mean, how much do we need to build those new ninjas and how much will things like heat, you know, simplify things? I mean, I've, I've, there's got to be that balance of kind of the, the experts and the generalists, yeah. and but you know, where, where do you see that playing out over the next few years? So, I, you know, heat is a good example of this. Um, what we've had is huge community contributions from the heat community, from the OpenStack community to make the templates available for OpenShift to deploy um, on any OpenStack distro. Um, that's a great opportunity for people, for people to learn heat. Um, but I think what we, we really need is even better education materials, even better um, certification and training programs. And so if you, know, if, if you were going to start up a new business now, training would be a great thing to start up because I think the certification of, and getting people um, the confidence I think that's the other piece of it is um, this stuff is not rocket science. It shouldn't be rocket science. You don't need to be a rock star to deploy OpenStack, but you do need some of the basics. You need the basic understandings of um, how everything is deployed, the different tool sets. 
And um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. The tools are out there. But you do need some confidence and get to get those skill sets. Yeah, so, so just because NASA was part of helping to create this, we don't need rocket right. scientists. So you're saying, yeah. actually, so I, I was reading through, pouring through the results from the user survey. And uh, they, they pulled out, I'm not sure who compiled the data, but they said their favorite quote was, over the last six months, the documentation for OpenStack has gotten pretty good. Uh, yeah. So you know, can, can you speak to, from kind of the training, the education, you know, wh wh where, where have we come, what still needs to be done? So a great shout out to Ann Gentle and to the folks at um, OpenStack who have really made a great effort to make sure the documentation is there. I'm not saying that the documentation is there. Um, uh, that's definitely wonderful and, and very easy and useful. Um, I think what's, what we're, we're seeing now is the next stage. We have um, the people who are the architects of OpenStack that are here at the OpenStack Summit. But the OpenStack Summit now is bringing in the users and people are you know, coming in and they want a session on how do I deploy OpenStack. Uh, they want the training on that. They really want to know the knowledge, the hands-on knowledge. So I suspect that maybe the next OpenStack, um, there'll be training sessions, there'll be hands-on sessions where you can learn to deploy this stuff. Um, and that's really what we're looking for, the next stage here. Um, of open you mentioned, we mentioned hiring. I mean, I was joking the other day. Yeah. I heard from someone if they up, once you update your LinkedIn profile, the word OpenStack on it, boom, you get like a zillion hits. Um, there is a huge demand for DevOps um, uh, candidates, and I say DevOps because you know this is a DevOps show. Let's face it. And this, yes. you know, we, we called it the other day. It's a DevOps show, uh, but DevOps is the future. This is where it's going. This is, Linux is not the same playbook it was that you guys made your yeah. bones in, in your business, but it's a cloud version of it. Yep. which is not orthogonal at all, it's just a different approach. That's yep. DevOps. That's DevOps. That's, that's Linux in the cloud. It's Linux in the cloud. <laughs> um, well, pretty much, you know, make, Linux is, is the underlying factor in most clouds um, that we're, we're seeing today. So if you have those basic Linux sys sysadmin skills, or if you come up through you know, the puppet and the, uh, the chef and you're a DevOps kind of person from that aspect, it's been an interesting evolution to see um, the developers who learn to be sysadmins so they get their stuff up and running and the, the ops people who have learned the dev side because everything has become programmable. Um, if yeah. you think about what Puppet and Chef and Ansible and other tool sets are, they're basically programmable interfaces for the infrastructure. And, and so the ops people have become developers too. So it's a new well, universe. Well, what's interesting is you mentioned sysadmins, and, and what's happening is as Linux has become a first class citizen in the enterprise, and it, it, listen, let's face it, it wasn't when it started. It was a cheap alternative to the other guys, yeah. the proprietary high license, and then it got a great position, and through open source, it became the deal. It's now the yeah. primary, and you're seeing enterprises do that. But what's also becoming a first class is are the people who got behind Linux. So if you look at Linux, who won with Linux besides the money makers and the, and, we won. And the VCs? We Developers won. The sysadmins, yeah. the people on the yeah. trenches deploying. Now, yeah. okay, where do those guys evolve into? So now they're, I'm not going to say they were second class citizens, but let's face it, they were cogs on the wheels of IT, deploying some servers and managing it great. And they were key parts of managing a, a, a button on the ship, if you will. But now, those guys are in a systems architecture. That's why I brought up the deck comment. Yeah. It's a systems operating system. We've, come, we've kind of come full circle. Uh, you know, for me, um, for, as a programmer from way back in the deck days, um, and coding was an art form and you were a crafts person and, and then it got really complicated and all that. But now we've, we've come to the full circle where the sysadmin side of, of things has become a programming art as well. And yeah. so we're, we've actually come so that the skill sets from being a developer and being an ops person have, have kind of merged. And my point is those people are now first class primary citizens in this re-engineering competitive advantage. You talk about sysadmins becoming the key keys to the kingdom yep. and, and Linux has lifted all the boats and the people and the talent. Yeah, and I, and I think Linux has done that and the cloud has done that too because it's given us the, the computing resources and the agility to take Linux to the next level and to really move forward and um, you know, it's interesting, we're talking all about Linux too, but um, there's a lot of .NET out there too now um, in the cloud, and so the, the mm, Azure, no, and, uh, eh, it's getting there. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't put them out to pasture .NET yet. .NET in the cloud, I mean, no, yeah, Well, give, give us a try, and uh, we've got some really- <laughs> That's a whole other cube session. That's I mean, another Don't cube get me going session. on .NET. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I can riff on that for hey, a long I'll, time. I'll be installing Visual Studio really soon. I think shortly. Linux is a little bit more efficient than .NET, but that's, that's a whole different nah, discussion. That's another argument. Diane, so I want to get you the final word here. We've got a break. I want you to tell the folks in your own words, why is this point in time in the industry so important? What, what, tell the folks who aren't on the inside why all the action's happening right now. Well, 
it's, it's, a com it's, it's a convergence of lots of skill sets. Like we said, the ops guys, the cloud architects, the Linux kernel people, um, the Docker people coming in and, and really making uh, real, real portable um, images uh, for all the different uh, applications and platforms and frameworks that we're using. So what we're seeing is the accessibility of, of a huge polyglot of different applications and frameworks and services that now are we have this amazing tool set that's really easy to deploy. So I think um, we see, we're going to see the next generation of application development and services on the base of the cloud, and it's just going to be exponential. I mean, we have really created the perfect enablement situation for everybody to go from idea to concept to production really rapidly with, this, with the resources now very, uh, very accessible. Well, certainly your job is uh, getting more and more exciting. The community is getting bigger. The contributors are growing. Um, soon we'll be measuring things in market share, total addressable market once this industry gets built. And I think exponential is a great word. Diane, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate the conversation. We'll be right back with our next guest here on theCUBE after this short break. All right, keep it open.